And now it's time and great pleasure to invite Dr. Tom Nasker to join us for his lecture on the plenary. Dr. Nasker is Chief Executive Officer, Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. He has been involved in medical education since 1981. In April 2007, he was named the first Anthony and Gertrude de Palma Dean of Jefferson Medical College. Dr. Nasker left the deanship at Jefferson to assume the role of CEO of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education in December to, uh, 2007. In May 2009, he became the founding CEO of ACGME International LLC. Dr. Nasker is certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine in Internal Medicine and Nephrology. He was a member of the Council on Graduate Medical Education of the Department of Health and Human Service of the U.S. Congress. He was named one of the 50 most powerful influential physician executives in many years by, by modern healthcare. He is the author of over 120 peer review articles, chapters, and other publications that has delivered more than 350 invited lectures and presentations worldwide on topics related to medical education. So we are so pleased to welcome you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's really a privilege to be with you, and uh, I look forward as well to next year in, uh, in Tokyo. It looks like it will be a wonderful uh, meeting in a wonderful location. I thought I would uh, spend a little bit of time telling you a few stories uh, about what I think is a growing understanding of our uh, important linkage between the quality of clinical care rendered and education. For those of you who don't know much about the ACGME, uh, it's a, a nonprofit entity in the United States, and uh, it's, it's composed of members of the public and the profession, and our goal really is to improve healthcare uh, through improvements in medical education uh, using the vehicle of accreditation. Uh, we have responsibilities for not only accreditation, but also educating the educators in the United States in graduate medical education and interfacing in the continuum and conducting research in, uh, in graduate medical education and its impact on patient outcomes. Uh, we have about uh, 9,600 accredited residency and fellowship programs in the United States with about 122,000 residents and fellows in training uh, this year. Now, I ask myself this question uh, when I received this wonderful invitation to come and speak with you about six months ago. Why would I be invited to come and speak at a, 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 a conference that seems to be focused predominantly on clinical quality and quality improvement, appropriately so. I, and then I began to think about the, the topic and the request, and I came to the realization that uh, the organizers wanted me to challenge this seeming dichotomous relationship between the educational world and the clinical care world. In most of our institutions, and I'll speak predominantly about the United States, we have a set of educational programs, and they coexist in a clinical care environment, but are administered and overseen completely separately. These separate clinical care and education systems probably are an old model that needs to be challenged. And over the next few minutes, I'd like to challenge that thought process with you and present a little bit different model. So I want to talk about two uh, journeys that are uh, coincident in time, but eventually converge. And one of them is ACGME's journey from regulating process of education to encouraging innovation in pursuit of excellence and meaningful educational outcomes. And the United States journey from to err is human through crossing the quality chasm towards the triple aim. So the journey for ACGME around outcomes started in 1998 when Susan Swing published a, uh, a brief article in the, the Journal of the American Medical Association alerting the field that ACGME would begin the process of trying to develop educational outcomes 
and that they would, we would eventually accredit educational programs based on outcomes rather than process. About uh, nine months later, the ACGME and the American Board of Medical Specialties, the certifying boards, came together and uh, uh, crystallized six domains of clinical competency, and I'm gonna show you those two in a second. And an ACGME then formed the Outcomes Project, which was a project to try and understand how we can take these theoretical competencies and actually make them meaningful in day-to-day -day practice and produce salutary outcomes. These are the six domains of clinical uh, medicine in the United States. Uh, they're a little bit different than Canameds, than the systems in Great Britain and the United Kingdom and in other parts of the world. But they all attempt to crystallize in one way, shape, or form the dimensions of uh, the role of the physician uh, and the many roles that physicians may play in an attempt to be able to understand them in a developmental trajectory that would aid in learners growing and maturing as clinicians. Now the first experiment in the United States uh, it came out of an internal medicine experiment that I was part of where we attempted to transform the accreditation model from one that centered on process, educational process, to educational outcomes. It was called the Education Innovations Project and it really became the forerunner of a new model of accreditation that I'll tell you about in a little while. The ACGME board then uh, established four strategic priorities, one of them to move from process to outcomes in order to create a new accreditation model. The accreditation model in the United States at that time was one that was heavily regulatory in nature. It was periodic in its nature. It would come every three to five years and visit a program and then really had little interchange with the program in the interim period of time. And the goal of the program was to satisfy minimum standards uh, in order to maintain accreditation. Uh, a reasonable, but probably not a continuous quality improvement model uh, that we would like to see. Now the other limb of this journey uh, began in the late 1990s as well, and that began with uh, the Institute of Medicine's publication to Air is Human, calling into question uh, the safety of patients in American hospitals and raising questions about our effectiveness in managing that safety and quality. Now in the year 2000, from 2000 to 2007, an experiment was undertaken uh, in the state of North Carolina, one of our, uh, our states, uh, and the state government poured significant amount of resources into its statewide hospital network in an attempt to minimize or reduce errors and harms to patients. And lo and behold, uh, there was no significant change after seven years, despite significant efforts which were largely based on um, tr traditional didactic educational experiences for physicians and nurses and other caregivers, and funding for improvement in systems, computer-based order entry systems and other kinds of systems. Now this was perplexing to us, uh, and it became further perplexing when uh, a national study looking at Medicare patients, those are patients over 65 in the United States, which found that there was some progress in some, uh, in some diagnoses, for instance, acute myocardial infarction and, in con and congestive heart failure, but not, for instance, in the post-operative patients. We at the ACGME then viewed this with some alarm because it suggested inadequacies of the educational system. Now, what do I mean by that? Over the course of time from 1998 till about 2010, that 12-year period of time, we turned over about 30% of the physicians in the United States. Now, if over that period of 12 years, we had been effective in educating residents and fellows, uh, young physicians, in safety and quality, presumably we would have moved the needle in safety and quality recognizing that safety and quality is a systems phenomenon, but physicians have a significant influence over that system. So we were alarmed and tried to understand why that was the case. Now also in parallel to these 
clinical care environment changes and our changes in thought process about the accreditation system, we dealt with an Institute of Medicine recommendation around resident duty hours. As you're all aware, there's remained significant controversy worldwide about the impact of resident duty hours or physician time on task and quality and safety. That debate uh, was focused in the United States, not on the practicing physicians, but on physicians in training. The interesting journey that we took in examining resident duty hours, and this is the New England Journal report that reports the changes that we made to our standards at that time, was that the task force assembled by the ACGME changed its name to the Task Force on Patient Safety and Professionalism because it recognized that the public really didn't care how many hours a doctor works. What they care about is are they safe in the bed? That's what they care about. It really doesn't matter to them how many hours we work, as long as we can demonstrate that we provide outstanding quality and safety. And this duty hours task force, in addition to making some recommendations about our duty hour standards, uh, challenge the ACGME to fulfill these three goals. That the actions of the ACGME assure the safety and quality of care rendered to patients in the teaching environment today, the safety and quality of care rendered to patients of our graduates in their future practice, and then to provide that educational experience in a humanistic fashion that promotes effacement of self-interest uh, or uh, altruism in the approach to the clinical care of their patients. That was the charge that that duty hours task force presented. So we asked then the fundamental question around that second bullet. Does the quality and safety and perhaps cost of clinical care rendered in the clinical learning environment have a relationship to the quality and safety and cost of clinical care rendered by our graduates in future practice? much a fundamental question that probably had never been specifically answered in that fashion. We've made many assumptions, all of us who do accreditation, that if we make sure that we have quality faculty and we have quality processes and we understand the curriculum, that the outcomes must be salutary and that the quality of care rendered must be good. But we've never really proven that. And we've never understood what the influences are on those kinds of outcomes. So, I'm going to present three studies to you that start to paint a picture. It's not a complete picture, but it's the beginning of a picture about the importance of the clinical learning environment on educational outcomes. I'm going to use physicians as an example, but I don't believe it's unique to physicians. I believe it's common to every clinician who is educated in a clinical care environment. So the first one is an association between residency training and internal ability to practice conservatively, as opposed to aggressively, sort of the polar opposites. And this is a study that was done by the American Board of Internal Medicine and some colleagues, uh, one of whom is with the ACGME now, Eric Hombo, who uh, examined the 2007 certification examination and looked at uh, Medicare patient uh, parameters around conservative versus aggressive management and stratified the training program environment uh, uh, according to those parameters, conservative or aggressive, and uh, in, uh, in uh, deciles. And then looked at the performance of the graduates on uh, a subset of the American Board of Internal Medicine questions. About 70 of them were uh, designed to elicit uh, conservative management as the correct clinical care option, and about 90 aggressive clinical care decisions. An example of a conservative one would be a patient who comes in with uh, an episode of shortness of breath uh, uh, related to a, uh, a viral illness, uh, and the appropriate response after uh, finding that pulmonary function tests are normal after the viral illness is over, that no other specific therapy is indicated. Uh, no obstructive lung disease was demonstrated on uh, those ventilatory capacities. And so conservative management, rather than recommending bronchodilators or, other, or steroids, would be the appropriate 
uh, intervention. That would be an example of a conservative uh, one, and an aggressive one would be a patient who comes in with ST elevation immediately going to the cardiac cath lab. So what they found was that residents who were educated in an environment that had the lowest intensity of clinical care scored the highest uh, on conservative management scores, and they stratified them based for their overall performance on the examination. Interestingly, when they looked at the aggressive questions, the aggressive care questions, residents who were trained in the lowest intensity area scored equally as well as residents trained in high intensity areas. What this indicates then is that the clinical learning environment has an influence on the sort of the philosophic approach that a physician has to clinical care, either conservative or aggressive. But interestingly, when educated in a conservative environment, the residents, now graduates, entering clinical practice, clearly understood aggressive circumstances when aggressive care was called for and applied those measures appropriately. The next study that I want to um, look at with you is a study related to cost, the cost of care. Uh, in many countries, uh, the cost of care is a major limiting factor in provision of sophisticated services to the population. In the United States, we are notorious for expensive clinical care. Uh, and uh, this is a major challenge for us, part of our triple aim, to control cost. So the question then is, uh, uh, what, does the training environment have an influence on cost? Well, uh, uh, Candace Chen and her colleague Fitzhugh Mullins, is a name you might know, also part of this uh, study, uh, looked at about 2,800 residents in internal medicine and family medicine who graduated between 1992 and 2010. And they looked at about a half a million patients cared for in 2011. And again, they stratified the clinical care environment, the learning environment, and the practice environment, uh, in, this time in thirds, low cost, medium, or average, and high, or high intensity. And what they found was that in clinical practice, up to 15 years after graduation, residents educated in a low cost environment provided care to Medicare patients at a low cost, no matter what the nature of the clinical care environment, high cost, intermediate, or low. The middle was indeed the middle, and high cost persisted in high cost up to 15 years after graduation. It, it continues when you look at uh, physicians trained in a low cost environment, and uh, when they practiced in a low cost environment after training, you can see it was, they had relatively low cost, but even when they trained in a high cost environment, after training in a low cost environment, they were significantly lower in cost than residents trained in an average or high cost environment. In other words, there's some imprinting of practice patterns that occurs that drives cost, not as, as well as aggressiveness or conservative nature of clinical care. This is very interesting because it shows, again, that this change persists. It persists not only one to seven years, eight to 15 years after graduation, but all the way out 16 to 19 years after graduation from the residency program. This theme will come out again when I show you the third study. So the clinical training environment, um, uh, uh, patient care expenditures are reproduced in the practice of their graduates. And the effect persists even when they practice in a different kind intensity of clinical care environment. And the effects last for up to 19 years after graduation. This next study was published by David Ash and Associates, and this gets to the question about quality and safety and the influence of the training environment on quality and safety. What uh, David and his colleagues did was they looked at uh, 5.6 million uh, deliveries uh, in two states in the United States, New York and Florida, where we have very, very good data about complications 
Uh, and uh, of that 5.6 million deliveries, 4.9 uh, million of those deliveries were accomplished by uh, formally trained uh, OBGYN physicians in the United States. They took the training environment, the, the actual statistics of the residency program institution, safety and quality, and they divided them up then into five buckets, from the lowest complication rate to the highest complication rate in equal allocations. There were 107 of these residency programs that produced these 4,124 physicians who provided those 4.9 million deliveries. And lo and behold, what did they find? They found that the clinical practice complication rate of the graduates in their clinical practice up to 15 years after graduation was linearly related to the complication rate of the training program of origin. Now, you might say, well, is this a recruiting phenomenon? Well, it, it, it probably is not, because if you correct these numbers for USMLE, which is the medical licensing examination in the United States scores, there's no difference in the data, none at all. The other is, is it biologically significant? Well, the difference between the lowest complication group and the highest complication group excess risk is 33%. 33%. I would posit that if you were having a delivery, you would consider that biologically significant. So, what's even more interesting is that in further following of these physicians, Ash demonstrated that the difference between the lowest now quartile versus highest quartile complication rate persists up to 17 years after graduation. Not demonstrated on this slide, but also very interesting is, it is not that the complication rate of the well-trained physicians went up. Both groups' complication rates went down in clinical practice. But the difference between the two groups, the highest and the lowest quartiles, was never ablated. There was an imprinting that went on during residency training that produced a better clinician, and it lasted for 15 years or more after graduation. It also dispels a common myth in the United States that you want a young obstetrician. You want the oldest, most mature obstetrician you can get your hands on, because they have seen everything. So what does this tell us? Well, the philosophy of conservative versus aggressive management of patients is influenced by the learning environment. That's knowledge and clinical judgment. The cost patterns of actual care up to 19 years after graduation from residency are influenced by the cost patterns of the clinical learning environment. And the complication rate, the safety and quality of patient care rendered in the, in the clinical learning environment is reproduced in the clinical practice of the graduate up to 18 years, 50, at least 15 years, after graduation. ACGME and accreditors like us worldwide are used to thinking about residency programs in isolation. We send a team out to look at the internal medicine program. We send a team out to look at the surgery program. In the late 1990s, we recognized that there need to be some in institutional oversight of these residency programs. And finally, we've recognized that they occur in the context of a clinical learning environment. And indeed, that clinical learning environment permeates the educational programs of every one of these specialties. So that there are, yes, dimensions of the specialty program that influence quality and effectiveness of education. But the clinical learning environment writ large also affects the quality of care rendered by graduates of those educational programs. So all of this leads us to really question our accreditation model, our old accreditation model, because it was producing those kind of doctors. So we began to ask and then answered, how are we going to move from that kind of a model, satisfaction of minimum standards with periodic visits, to a continuous quality improvement model? And then we described that in the New England Journal, and there are three key elements to it. The first is the next, what we call the next accreditation system. It now happens to be the accreditation system. 
The second is the culmination of the outcomes project, which is really measuring milestones and watching learners' trajectories. And I'm going to show you some data about that. And then the clinical learning environment review, where we actually go out and look about, look about quality and safety in the learning environment and the integration of the educational programs into the institutional programs of quality and safety. Just a, a, a one slide on the next accreditation system. It is a classic cl quality improvement model where annually the, the residency program is expected to look at it, the program, review its established aims, look at the annual peer feedback which comes from the residency review committee on an annual basis, look at resident evaluations, their milestone performance, board certification performance, and the uh, clinical context evaluation and look at their community needs assessment and be sure that the graduates that you're producing are meeting local community needs. If necessary, modify the program then and then repeat the cycle. Every 10 years, whether they need it or not, we come and visit them. We look at their data every year, but we come and visit them periodically to determine whether indeed they are effective in achieving their program aims with the goal of achieving excellence, not just satisfaction of minimum standards. And then we look at the clinical learning environment every two or three years with a team going to each institution to review the clinical learning environment for its effectiveness in educating residents in safety, quality, and, and professionalism. Those three goals that I talked about from the duty hours task force. This is the, these are the elements of the clear learning environment review. I must tell you that the Clear Learning Environment Review has finished its first cycle of review of major teaching hospitals in the United States and found considerable variability in the approach to these issues. And the next step now is really to try and understand which variability is beneficial and which variability is not. There is a national coalition that has been formed, not only of physician education, but nursing education, pharmacy education, social worker education, all around the clinical context. It's called N-Cycle National Coalition for Improvement in the Clinical Learning Environment. And that group uh, actually uh, meets every six months to try and tackle issues in the clinical learning environment. Now a question I'm frequently asked is, can we really measure and track educational outcomes in 122,000 residents and fellows? Well, we started small. We started in Singapore uh, a number of years ago. This is the internal medicine resident data from the graduating cohort in 2013 uh, in internal medicine. And you can see that there's tremendous heterogeneity in the path uh, of uh, milestone accumulation and growth. Uh, I will tell you that uh, these individuals took the uh, combined AB, uh, ABMS uh, Singapore certification exam, and I believe 92% of them passed on the first try, so a highly successful group of individuals. This is uh, 21,767 internal medicine residents, 100% of the residents in the United States in internal medicine training, and you can see their learning trajectories. This is the mean and standard deviation of um, all of the milestones in each one of the six domains of clinical competency. They, they demonstrate the, the expected learning trajectory, but with significant standard deviations, significant, a phenomenon that we need to understand better. This is the data in neurosurgery, and I'm going to point it out for, for a little bit different reason. This is displayed a little bit differently. This is the percentage of residents in each of the six domains of clinical competency achieving what we call level four, which is the level of performance expected at entry into the unsupervised practice of medicine. And what is alarming at first blush here is that the, the bottom bar there is patient care. That's a pretty alarming. At the end of seven years of training in neurosurgery, only 56% met all of the patient care elements. It turns out that this is related to one element, movement disorders and epilepsy surgery, uh, which probably should not be learned uh, to the level of proficiency required uh, for independent practice by every fellow. It's not surgery that's widely available in every training program, but it has caused significant discussion in neurosurgery, exactly what we wanted, and we were able to initiate that discussion in July after accumulating this information in June. 
So it gives us the opportunity to rapidly understand where we have deficiencies in educational outcomes and try and rectify them at a national level. We never would have known about this had we not had uh, this kind of an evaluation process. This is a uh, pathology residence, again, across the six domains of clinical competency, but I want to point out uh, the, they have 27 different categories or milestones, and there was one area that seemed pretty striking, only about 40%, 60% uh, total of the residents reached proficiency, and that was in clinical informatics. A new sub-area in pathology, a fair amount of work to be done in the development of expertise uh, because of changes and needed changes in the local learning environment. Again, we provided this information to the pathology community, the professors of pathology, on the, on the 14th of July, having gathered this data in June. The ability to provide, at a national level, specialty-specific areas for improvement in the clinical repertoire of our graduates. So what, I, what I've hope I've, I've made the case for is that those two circles should not be separated. Indeed, the clinical educational outcomes of residents and fellows, and I would posit likely nurses and likely pharmacists and likely other caregivers, are intimately related to the quality and clinical care outcomes of the clinical learning environment and that we need to look at these together. We need to increasingly bring them together in a cohesive fashion so that as the clinical learning environment changes, it is changed in a fashion that benefits the educational program. Because if we do not, we will continue to recapitulate the outcomes that we have today. We believe that this is why the clinical care outcomes in the United States have not improved as rapidly as the effort would have portend, uh, predicted it would have, because we did not change fundamentally the clinical learning environment intentionally integrating in the residents into quality and safety efforts, and we are now attempting to do that. Now here's the additional challenge. This is a, uh, a scatter graph uh, that comes from the LeapFrog group. It's a group that looks at healthcare quality and costs in the United States. And this is a quality composite score on the x-axis with the highest score being the highest quality. And this is resource composite score with the best score, most appropriately score, being higher as opposed to lower. And you can see the teaching hospitals are in the diamonds and the small crosses are uh, non-teaching hospitals in the United States. You can see that we have exemplary hospitals up here in the upper quartile in both of those measures. And the predominant ones are teaching hospitals. And if you look at the top 25% uh, 25, uh, 25 score, it, the, the hospitals that predominate in this box here, I must, have, I must be tired, <laughs> uh, uh, are, uh, um, are teaching hospitals. But these are very expensive teaching hospitals. So the clinical care rendered in those teaching hospitals is very expensive. What do you think the graduates of those, people, those programs are gonna do? they're gonna reproduce expensive care when they go out and practice, even if they practice in this teaching hospital up here. So the goal really needs to be to move all of the institutions upward and to the right. And the, way, uh, the path to doing that, I believe, is first attacking the teaching hospitals and getting the teaching hospitals to be more effective so that they seed the non-teaching hospitals with graduates who can bring that quality and safety and cost efficiency to those institutions and help move them up to the right. Obviously, physicians are not the only element of success in that regard, but I believe they are a key element, a hypothesis that we need to, uh, that we need to study. So what's the next phase of our work? It's really uh, refinement of the milestones in each of our specialties, uh, and what our, our, we really have a goal of linking specific educational outcomes to excellence in clinical practice outcomes after graduation. We need to understand what, what is predictive of excellence in clinical practice and make sure that we understand that and develop that in our trainees. We need to effectively integrate educational and clinical care systems across the clinical learning environment, as I mentioned, and that N-Cycle and ACGB and many organizations are in the process of trying to do that. 
We further need to identify attributes. These are very, the studies that I presented to you are very gross measures of attributes of the clinical learning environment. But we really need to understand what is really predictive of excellence in clinical care outcomes in our graduates after they enter clinical practice. And then we have to continue that journey to push our institutions upward and to the right in that quality and cost uh, paradigm. Just a few parting thoughts. Uh, my Italian's not great. Assesso di difficile pero no impossible. Okay? The way forward is difficult, but it's not impossible. We can figure this out. If we can figure the genome out, we can certainly figure out how to develop, to deliver high quality, safe care. And I'm optimistic. I, I believe that what lies before, behind us and before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. I think this conference has been all about that, trying to find out ways to make things better. Make things better for patients, make things better for the public, the public health, and I believe that education can go hand in hand with that. So I believe the future is indeed bright, and thank you very much for coming out this morning. Thank you, Tom. We have time for questions. Who wants to, to start? Yeah, please. You have mic. Thank you. So please use, use the mic because it's really difficult to listen to you. <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> One of the interesting things about it was that when we um, initiated the idea of setting up rural clinical schools in previously non-teaching hospitals, it met, it, it, uh, met a lot of re uh, opposition from the traditionalists. Yes. But what happened was, in fact, was that the people in the rural clinical schools, and there are now 16 of them, started getting better results than the ones in the major teaching hospitals. But what happened, of course, is because they got such high marks, they went to do their first PGY-1 in the major teaching hospitals mm -hmm. and thus deprived the, um, the, um, the country hospitals of that expertise that yes. they were generating, they were rural hospitals. So that is, we've now presented the, uh, a situation where we have now, we took a very radical step and said the small teaching hospital now in, in populations of 4,000 where you have only got primary care doctors, that w they are teaching hospitals. And it's had an extraordinary effect in, in providing instead of a, um, a, a centrifugal model, uh, we've now got a centrifugal model. And it's very important that that we, could, we underestimate the teaching capacity of the, or the teaching ability of small country or small hospitals because we haven't paid enough attention to them. And I was very interested in that scatter graph because I'd be interested in some of those small ones. But you, you obviously have, it's been one of the reasons why we've been able to expand the medical graduates by having this rural clinical school program. Now, I wanted to move to a question because I, in my, my fading years, was faced with becoming a director of clinical training without any formal training. And I noticed you had that overlapping clinical outcomes and educational outcomes. And I'm now faced with the task of working out whether, in fact, medical education is, in fact, a legitimate subspecialty, having gone through this process with my colleague Sue Mori next door in public health, mm -hmm. where it was not seen as a, a specialty. And I'd like your comments on whether you think that there is a role for dedicated medical administrators, given the fact that you've, the clinical experience, whatever it is in terms of what, what, what when the, the assumptions which, which says this is conservative and this is high cost. And obviously underlying that is a very interesting barrage of, mm -hmm. uh, of information and questions. I just, 
interested in your views on whether you see medical education as a legitimate specialty in its own right. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to have a cadre of well-trained physician educators working likely with uh, non-physician uh, professional educators uh, to, to create frameworks within which clinician physician educators can function. Uh, I believe that most physicians uh, have the capacity to share what they're doing with someone, and if they do it well, they will share something positive, and those graduates will be effectively educated. But I do believe that there is pedagogy and especially evaluation uh, um, uh, methodology that uh, professional educators or f formally trained physician educators uh, bring to the table, which is in addition to, but equally necessary to the clinical expertise at the bedside. Now, whether that's a specialty or not, uh, you know, the, it depends on the locale and, and, uh, and, and how one recognizes one expertise. In the United States, we have professionalized the role of the program director and, and uh, educational faculty uh, in the sense that we expect institutional support for those individuals in accomplishing those tasks. So in that sense, I believe we, we have done that. We have a, a number of outstanding master's programs, and Europe and a number of parts of the, of the, of the world have excellent medical education master's uh, and doctoral programs. Uh, I'm thinking, thinking Maastricht in, in, uh, in Europe and a number of other places there. So some just fabulous educational, formal educational environments for medical educators. Uh, we have a couple in Chicago as well, where I happen to live right now. So uh, I do believe that there is an important role, but we should never underestimate the role of the bedside clinician in their ability to educate, and not just educate physicians, and also to understand that there are other health professionals who educate physicians as well. I learned an awful lot from the nurses that I wor worked with in my residency and fellowship training. Uh, so I think there's we have a community of educators, but I do think that there is a role for the professional educator. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for a very interesting, stimulating uh, talk on, on a subject that perhaps most of us haven't given a lot of thought to other than the, uh, reading the articles in the New England Journal every five or seven years. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Jim Robley. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist from the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, which is a uh, teaching uh, ac academic health science center. My question relates to uh, the organizations uh, that are, are teaching residents along with very active research programs, both basic science and uh, clinical mm -hmm. uh, research and so on and so forth. Does your data show any difference uh, in, in uh, organizations that have a high intensity of research as part of the training? I, I'm, I, I think it's premature for me to try and answer that uh, from a milestone evaluation standpoint. Uh, and there, there will be confounding variables, uh, as our first commenter indicated. Uh, those institutions uh, in general, now I'm making generalities here, not specific, recruit uh, an academically highly prepared individual so that there's a trainee bias in, implicit in, that would have to be, uh, be looked at. What we have seen, though, um, in, in this is preliminary look, is that they don't necessarily march hand in hand. Uh, that uh, that a, a research intensive environment can have a very positive impact on educational outcomes, uh, but it can also uh, at times, uh, depending on the nature of the clinical supervision in those programs, actually not be as good as a small community hospital or a rural hospital. Uh, uh, and the reason is that some of those institutions, not all of them, but some of them, do not, um, are not as, um, 
diligent, I don't want to say diligent, that's a bad, I'm looking for the right word here, uh, are not as, um, uh, as um, constantly experienced in direct patient care as they are on the research side. Uh, we still have institutions where uh, faculty spend one month a year on the clinical service. Well, you can't be an expert clinician and provide sophisticated, state-of-the-art, highly cost-efficient care doing it one month a year. I, I just don't, I believe, just as you can't do research at that level one month out of the year. So uh, I think that there, that paradigm still exists in some of our major teaching institutions in the United States. And to the extent that it does, it may or may not be associated with the kind of clinical and cost efficiency outcomes that we would desire. So they don't go necessarily hand in hand, research intensive and highest quality. But I don't have definitive proof of that uh, yet. So maybe in a couple of years we'll have a little bit better data. More questions? I have one about the relative proportion of non-technical skill training and, and, and technical skill training. Uh, how do you see that now and in the future? Is that something changing progressively? Well, I think for technical, well, non-technical, but uh, as well. But but I think uh, there is increasing um, introduction early on in training of simulation. Uh, we are seeing um, many of our major academic medical centers have built large simulation facilities. And these facilities uh, simulate everything from an outpatient clinic all the way through the operating room or endoscopy or angiography. Uh, and these highly sophisticated simulators um, uh, are increasingly demonstrated to improve the safety of patients and the first clinical intervention of residents. There's some interesting work uh, that's been done in, in many locations. One I'm, I'm familiar with um, in Chicago, uh, looking at uh, neurology residents and spinal taps, and using simulation uh, and then spinal tap effectiveness and complication rates, uh, and uh, and showing a dramatic benefit of introduction in simulation and then uh, uh, clinical care as opposed to learning at the bedside, when a randomized control trial. So. Uh, there's good data that simulation does work, and increasingly uh, the technology is advancing rapidly. Um, we have a couple of centers in the United States that actually are doing holographic projections, um, three-dimensional holographic projections of, of CT and MRI scans or CT merged PET scans in anticipation of surgical procedures, and we are probably two or three years away from virtual surgery in those circumstances. When we, on the anatomy of the patient they will operate on. The, the benefit there is far beyond just education. The benefit there really is for direct patient safety and quality because you can practice the exam on the anatomy of your patient before you go into the operating room the next day. I think this is, that's really in the offing. So I think that there's some really exciting technology for technical skills and better uh, and safer introduction of the new learner in technical skills in the clinical care environment. Thank you. The last question, please. Yes, thank you. Hi, Tom. Mindy Hi. McKenna, United States. And uh, I want to thank you for excellent presentation helping us connect relationships between various influencing factors. In your extensive research that you've been doing about the impact of residency training on practice up to 15 years later, my question to two part, have you come across anything that would show a mediating influence of continuing professional development? Does it help, does it hurt, does it not influence one way or the other? And then secondly, um, that's the lens I, I bring, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so would you see next steps that you would be hoping for or advising us in the United States or in any country as we try to connect the dots between residency education, quality and practice, but then also CPD? Yeah, I, I don't have, I think certainly maintenance of certification is one element and the process that physicians go through in maintenance of certification. I believe, uh, the especially the practice-based learning and improvement component, uh, have a salutary benefit to the clinical practice of patients. I haven't seen data that looks at 
non versus uh, MOC uh, uh, physicians. I, I sort of have a dream for, for uh, now this is, please don't quote me on this one because I'll get in trouble back home. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to see is a system that allows for an entity to pick up the milestone trajectory of the physician as they graduate. Because this is a lifelong journey. The milestones don't end at graduation. The, the physicians, as we all know, continue to develop in clinical practice. Those first five years are especially formative in the ultimate destiny of the physician, whether they become a master clinician or they remain an expert or a proficient clinician. And uh, as they move through their career, they differentiate and they sub-differentiate into nuanced, narrow areas that uh, are unique to their patient population, the population that they serve. I would love to see a system that is able to track that and then provide to the physician a menu of opportunities for continuous professional development that is tailored to them. Now you might say, is this crazy? Well, Amazon.com does this every day. If you, how many of you have a, a Kindle? I mean, I, I have like 10 of them, because my kids all have them and everything, we all share the books. And whenever anybody buys a pattern of books, it pops up on my email because I pay for it. So it, it comes to me, the bill comes to me. So I know it, and they keep recommending a series of new texts. Well, in my clinical practice, for the first seven years, I'm a nephrologist, but most of my work was in, in therapeutic apheresis. And, um, and, and, so, and stem cell harvesting and a bunch of other things. So um, I should have had someone tailoring that for me so I could develop along my trajectory and improve my patient care along the way, based, ultimately based on the outcomes of my patients, which should be computerized and feeding into this system. I really believe that that's the direction that we have to go. And continuous the field changes so rapidly without continuous professional development, we are lost. Uh, because that's why it takes 15 years to get something from research into clinical practice, because we don't have these effective point of need kinds of introduction of the information to the clinician. It's catch as catch can. So I, uh, I fully support the importance of continuous pro pro professional development. I think it's absolutely essential. And I believe that we have many groups um, in the United States and, uh, and worldwide that are dedicated to this. The certifying boards, the ACCME, all of our institutions are dedicated to continually help us. But I think that that's the opportunity that maybe within the next 10 years could happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nasca. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.